for today's live show. And I apologize, we're on a little bit late. It seems the technology only doesn't work when we have a superstar on as a guest. Not to say that all my guests aren't superstars in their own right, but this gentleman really is. He has been doing what he's been doing longer than I've been alive. And I've been alive a pretty long time. I'm 60 years old now. Many people like myself consider him really the father of nutritional medicine, the plant-based movement. He, he really is an icon. And I would venture to say he probably is the most beloved person in the plant-based movement. And if you ever go on the vegan cruise, they introduce you kind of in or, order of hierarchy of how important you are. And they always say, save this gentleman for last. And he always gets a standing ovation. I would say that I spend most of my time interviewing doctors for this show and for summits and more people were influenced by his work to become plant-based eaters and help their patients, I think, than anyone else. Last week, we had his son on. A couple of days ago, we had his daughter-in-law on. I'm sure we're going to have his other son on very soon. It is an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to be able to spend time with Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Thank you so much for being here. I'm just so excited to get to talk to you. Thank you so much. You're so immensely complimentary. It's incredible. Thank you. Well, but, but I don't, it's not, I, I'm not even, I, I mean it. That's the thing. I mean, I, I just, I love you so much and what you've done in your family. I mean, I think of you as plant-based royalty. So, you know, what can I tell you? And I just, I don't know who's going to fill your shoes. You know, even though I've got all these wonderful children, there's nobody quite like you. So, uh, what can I tell you? And I know we're going to have so many people here today breaking the internet, wanting to talk to you. We've even asked people to email in questions, but I don't think that some people realize you're actually not a medical doctor. So we cannot have you be answering their medical questions. We'll save those for Tom. Correct. Oh. So for what have, what have you been doing these past you know nine weeks or so since we've been sheltering at home? How has the pandemic affected you and your work? It's basically the same thing. I'm learning how to use uh, this virtual lecturing business. <laughs> that's for sure. That's an amazing technology that's really now coming into its own with all of this. And uh, so, yeah, I've been writing and, and uh, you know, doing interviews, obviously, and things like that. Uh, so we finally got some sun here in this part of the country. That's been nice. So we just planted some vegetables yesterday. That's uh, you, you live in you live in New York, right? Yeah, upstate New York, correct. Wow. So we so when it, when it's like 90 to 100 here, it's probably like 40 or 50 where you live. That's you're, you're literally correct, I think. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Wow. Yeah. You must like it though cuz you've been there a long time. Yeah, we have. I came here for graduate school at Cornell University in August 1st, 1956. And I think that was before you were born. I think you were right, AJ. Yep, 19. So uh, I've been in the profession actually since August, that day. It was August 1st, 1956. So I'm going on my, what is that, 64th year. That's incredible. That it, you know, you're such a trailblazer, Dr. Campbell. And so many people look to you as is, is the reason that they're doing what they're doing. But who did you have to inspire you? Because who was before you doing this? Nobody. Well, I had lots of people. I, I owe an immense amount of gratitude to all kinds of people. My dad and mom, of course, uh, you know, start with my dad was always into, uh, you know, telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. <laughs> I heard that so many times. Uh, he was a farmer, only had a couple years education, actually. And uh, he went out of his way to make sure I got an education and, you know, had a, had a future in front of me. And I, he, just to mention this uh, briefly, just to illustrate the point. We were over 50 miles west of Washington, D.C. when I was raised on a farm, milking cows. Uh, I drove to school back and forth over 100 miles a day uh, just to go to high school because of his passion for me getting uh, an education. So that's the way I answer the question. Uh, but uh, a lot of people now in the more recent years, in the last 58 years, the more recent years, I owe a lot to my wife, Karen. Uh, she made me eat what she fixes, and I ate what she fixes. And so, yeah, we, we got into it together. Had children, obviously. Yeah, that, that's the way it was. Well, you know, your, your granddaughter uh, came in during the demo that Kim was doing, and I said, do you have any idea who your grandfather is? I said, is, this, is, he, is he just grandpa to you, or do you understand that he's Dr. Colin Campbell? I think she didn't understand, like, growing up, what a big deal you were. 
Yeah, well, I guess she knew I existed, but that's that's the way it was. Family relationships, <laughs> the best of the all worlds, actually. What's so nice is you're so humble because you're you know you're like the equivalent in the plant based world of like like Mick Jagger, like a rock star, and you're always so kind. People just hover around you, and on the cruise, everybody wants your time, and you're so kind to people. You know, you don't push them away, you don't get angry, and I really appreciate that about you. Well, thank you very much. I try to respect others, that's for sure. Does it ever get overwhelming being you? <laughs> no, actually, I like my work. Uh, you know, I, I felt like I had a purpose in a sense. When I went to graduate school and not long thereafter was on a faculty, uh, I, I really like science. Uh, and I, I make this comment here at the, at the start. When I say I like science, I'm not talking about I like the scientific institutions because science itself as an institution is not terribly popular these days with the public, to be honest about it. And there's good reason. There's good reason because the scientific enterprise, if you will, uh, in my estimation, in academia, I have to say, uh, and also in government policy where I participate as well, I mean, you know, there's a tremendous influence from the corporate sector into the scientific community. And so when the public reacts to, you know, something scientific, um, they're oftentimes really reacting to something they're not aware of. They're reacting to what is being said by people who are abiding by whatever corporate interests are. Not a very good system. Uh, so when I say I like science, I like it because when I was quite young, I was really quite young, I got uh, academic tenure uh, when I was in my 30s, which is fairly young for that. And that enabled me to have so-called academic freedom. Now, I wasn't the only you know, other people, we, but that, all that's about disappeared. And so I had a lifetime, now more than 50 years, a lifetime of uh, you know, being able to say what I wanted to say. And that was, <laughs> that was important because had I not had that opportunity, I would not be sitting here now saying what I'm saying. It's that simple. Uh, because there's a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. And some of it can be very, very serious. That's a story into itself, onto itself. And uh, so, yeah, so when, when, when I come back to my main point, science, yes. I, I, if I could describe just briefly, briefly what science is, because I'm not sure there's that well respected even in, well, in the nutrition community for sure. Nor I would suggest not in the plant-based community either, as much as I would like to see it, namely, Science is what I call the art of observation. Anybody can be a scientist in many ways. We see something, we observe something. Maybe we have questions, okay? We have, we have questions about it. So typically what we do, we say, okay, I'm going to hypothesize such and such is true. And I can hypothesize that the moon is made out of cheese if I want to, to, get, to get, make my point. We can say anything we want to see, whatever our interpretation is of a particular observation, then it's, our, then it's our responsibility, as, as the person making that statement, it's our responsibility to prove with evidence or do experiments to prove with evidence that uh, what we thought was true is true. So let's say we get some results. Sometimes the results don't go our way, obviously. Got to be honest about it. Sometimes it does go our way. Uh, and then at that particular point in time, we, generally speaking, we're required to write it down you know, put it in a journal, publish it, and get feedback. That's really critical. That's what peer review is all about. We have to submit a publication in a professional journal. And uh, if we get pushback, you know, there's somebody say, hey, you're all wrong. It either doesn't get published or they may let it go, but we've got to be able to answer it, which raises another very important point. We've got to be able to uh, accept criticism. we got to be prepared to be wrong. So it's, it, there's a rigor, there's a rigor and there's a system in this business that we try to, I mean, this, I'll talk about theoretical, unfortunately, these days, ideologically, there's a, there's a system by which we, you know, face the facts, if you will, or don't face the facts. And we got to do that the same with friends as well as uh, people we may not know so well. And the reason we're going on about this, uh, AJ, one more, one more thing. When I went into this business, being raised on a farm, it was all about 
consuming enough protein. And that made animal based protein. That was it. And uh, so when I went away to graduate school, in fact, at that point, point in time, I did my doctoral dissertation on trying to advance the cause of consuming animal protein. And that was published. And so I was, I was in the game, you know, just like uh, with the rest of the crowd. Uh, then when I had my first faculty position at Virginia Tech, uh, I was actually being paid by my salaries, being paid by a grant from the US State Department. And so in that case, I was going back and forth to the Philippines a lot with my senior colleague. And we were organizing a program to feed malnourished children. That was a lesson. That was an experience really almost impossible to describe. But the idea there was to make sure these kids got enough protein like we do in the West. So here I am coming farm all about protein to the extent I even thought about it, probably didn't. You know, pr producing milk, good protein, going to college, uh, graduate school, I should say, and then doing doctoral dissertation, advancing protein, go to the Philippines, making sure these kids got enough protein. And what I saw was something really at odds with that. The few individuals, the few individual families that were getting enough protein like we do in the West, their kids seem to have a higher risk of getting liver cancer. So that was odd to say the least. And then there was a study out of India using experimental animals that kind of supported that idea. Higher protein, higher in cancer. So I was presented with a dilemma. I came back home and got a grant from NIH to continue for the next 27 years and lots of other grants. But in any case, the question was, is it true that animal protein can increase cancer? That was it. That was the issue. That was against my own personal beliefs. That was against my background and against everything. And it was also, also against the tradition of the community, if you will. And we got results. And we got results that said, yes, animal protein is a problem, a big problem. Nothing like it. Then I had a choice to make. Do I go along with the crowd? in science, because at that time, everybody believed, not just the public, but everybody in my profession thought animal protein is where it starts. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Do I go against that tradition? Do I go against the tradition of my, of my family, of the farm family? Do I go against the tradition of the rural people I know? I'm one of them. I mean, I, I had to kind of think about that. So we, we kept doing experiments, you know, over and over, different ways. And finally, after a couple of years, there was no question about it. Animal protein is a problem. In fact, the protein we were using, the casein, to be specific, the protein at that particular time was judged to be the highest quality protein, okay? So we drink milk and the dairy industry promoted, et cetera, et cetera. And at that particular point in time, uh, here I was challenging something pretty sacred. Do I, you know, do I jump ship? Do I, I might have, I don't know whether I would have or not, but you know, I had tenure by this time. I was saying it like it is. And I, I kept that up for the next 40 years. But that was only the first observation. There were many others that I ended up, as I kept going all the time and just learning for myself and my students, and I had lots of great students and and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. You, you always felt good about it. You go to sleep at night. But whatever you did, if, if it didn't turn out the way you th thought it would, then you think again, <laughs> if you do, do it over again. But you, you can only live with the truth, only live with the truth. But, so I may be a pain on the, you know what, to some friends at times, uh, whether in a plant-based community, I have to say, or whether it's with the public. But I, I have to live, live by what I live by. And that is I either accept, I, if somebody wants to challenge me, that's, the, that's great. I love challenge, that's, that's not a problem. But all I, all I can say is, that, sorry about that. All I can say is that uh, if anybody wants to challenge me, it's their business and I'm willing to be challenged, as, as I said. Come and tell me, what do you have? Show me the data. And I want to see it, you know, in good, reliable form. So that's me. Uh, I, I went on too long for your interview, but uh, I, I did want to make that point because our conversation may center on that. 
because I might not I might not say things that you agree with, but just take take it for what it is. Well, you, I, I don't know. You could never go on too long. And and Jeannie wants to know if your career, if your convictions, has your career suffered at all because of your convictions? Uh, yeah, I I could say yes, big time. Uh, I mean, there were chat. There were uh, one time uh, I was on a National Academy panel back in 1980, 80 and eighty two. Uh, was doing some research. That's when I came up with the word plant based nutrition. By the way, because uh, I didn't want to use the word vegetarian, because that was kind of that was on the other side of the fence from what we thought. But in any case. And, and I was on that panel and, and we reported, made a report, the National Academy of Science did on diet, nutrition, cancer. Only 13 of us on that panel worked a couple of years. And then I was the one who actually gave the testimony before congressional committees as a result of what we said. And, and we said something really simple. It was so simple. Eat your vegetables. You know, cut down on fat intake. It was fairly simple, but it was pretty striking for those days. So the industry got really upset. As a result, there was a petition to have me thrown out of my society which was my professional society, which would have been the end of my career. And so there was actually a hearing in Washington, believe it or not, because all I was doing is telling the truth. Well, they failed. That would have been the first time in the history of that society. And then thereafter, uh, things did fly my way a lot. Somebody on a couple of cases tried to get me thrown out of Cornell, because by this time I'm a full professor, tenured, et cetera, et cetera. That didn't work either, thank goodness. Uh, and then I got an extension of the China project, a uh, big grant there for $7 million, uh, you know, the three or four years later. And uh, that was awarded. That was awarded, judged to be, you know, high quality, pay line, all that sort of stuff. But then they turned it down because uh, there was a rumor that I, it was, I had committed fraud in China. So, you know, that's, that's just some of the things. So I get yet yeah, to be honest about it. Yeah, that that was a cost and, and some other things in a sense. But you know what? The only way I could live with that was uh, I, I tried to look at it in a positive way. And I said, well, that's an opportunity. You know, it, it was an opportunity for me to be able to be in that position to see what what kind of pushback can come. And I can therefore see where where we do get pushback has been very valuable for this whole plant-based movement, for me at least. And uh, so, you know, I kind of stuck with it. Uh, and I, I, the second book we did was Whole. And I wrote it in there. I dedicated it to, to all my critics. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's what it is. And still today, I, I, I find myself, um, you know, on the wrong end of the stick. Uh, according to some of my colleagues and friends, but it's been very exciting because uh, the work the work we ended up doing and living, we lived it, we live what we learned. Uh, you know, thanks to my wife, as I said, who uh, you know started chasing our food and stuff like that, and so it just became so convincing. And then, of course, I started meeting some people. The first ones I met was uh, John McDougall. Uh, who had a radio station, wanted me to come and talk to the station, and he's turned out to be a great friend. And he, he was doing something, you know, with patients, not necessarily from, you know, all this background that I had nutrition, but still, he was doing something, and he was, he was boots on the ground and doing stuff in short work. And then uh, old Coldwell Esselton called, and uh, we established a great relationship and went to a conference of his, and Dean Orish went uh, straight off, and I, I could name, I, I'm really hesitant to name too many names, but people like Alan Goldhammer for a different kind of reason, Doug Lyle, Pam Popper. Uh, in those early days, uh, I suddenly just was making friends with a lot of people who were sort of in this field, doing things with people. I wasn't, not being a physician, I couldn't go out and do that kind of thing. Uh, although in China, we had a big study there with humans, but it was a different kind. So. Yeah, it's uh, so, so I was I was compensated by friendship, you know, with with these other people, obviously. So yeah, so it's only only a technical matter that I was getting pushed back, as far as I'm concerned. So many people are saying how they went vegan because of your book and gave up dairy because of your book. Are you the one who actually coined the term plant based? 
Yes, I did. Uh, it was very conscientious, and this was in somewhere in the period of 1978 and 79. At that time, I was on a committee of the National Institutes of Health, specifically the National Cancer Institute. They were the ones, you know, funding my work. And so I was on a committee there. And this committee is called a study section for any scientists who may be listening. I was on a study section that was on chemical carcinogenesis. That was my other hat that I was wearing. And uh, there were, I don't know, it was 15 of us. And it's a very formal process, by the way, very rigorous, very formal. Our charge is to determine who gets the grants. A lot of grants come into NIH and they get reviewed. And so they have a committee of so-called experts who review who gets the grants and who don't. And I was on that committee. And so at that time, mind you, this is 78, 79, uh, and most of the re research coming in was how to, to investigate cancer, which I was doing too at the time. And, and uh, but I was the only one on the committee of 14 to 15 of us or whatever it was, who actually was in the area of nutrition. So I was always being assigned these applications that had a leaning toward nutrition. And, uh, and I, I got that and I was being overburdened with a, a bit because all of a sudden it was just interest in nutrition. So the rest of the committee who were pathologists, oncologists, molecular geneticists and so forth, they wanted me to take some time in the next meeting, we'd meet three times a year in the next meeting to take a couple of hours and uh, just explain what does nutrition mean? They, they, they weren't trained in nutrition. Most of them were MDs and PhD, but not in nutrition. So I had to think about that. And I knew that at that time, this, mind you, this is 78, 79. So I was thinking about what to say. One of the words that came to mind was vegetarian, but I didn't want to use that word. The vegetarians were actually uh, demonstrating to some extent outside of my lab, to be honest about it because we were using experimental animals. So I wasn't on their side <laughs> from that point of view. And the word vegan, I never even heard of it at that time. That didn't come until 10 years later. But in any case, uh, at, at that time, uh, I was going to the meeting and I was saying, OK, I'm gonna, I got a couple of hours here. We're going to talk about nutrition. And I thought to myself, I don't want to use the V word. As much respect as I have for that motivation that I do, that's not the issue. It's great motivation to become, you know, vegetarian or vegan, whatever the case may be. That's not the issue. It's just the fact that if that is the only, if that's the only thrust of this argument for the public, it hasn't done very well, to be honest about it. It's been a hard sell because the sell is on the basis of ethics. Now, who can, who can be against ethical behavior? I mean, that's a fact. So we're all, we're all like that. But the fact is, I, I, I figured for myself, coming from the outside of the community, that I, I, that was not the reason I got into this. It wasn't just not, it had nothing to do with it. I wanted to rely on the idea of science. So I was trying to think of something what I could say. And it was kind of an awkward term, I thought at the time. I said, well, okay, it's plant-based. Let's call it plant-based. That's what I told the committee. And then I published on that a couple of years later. Uh, so eventually, then I got to a second word there, having to do with the idea that nutrition works when it's in a whole food form. It doesn't work as single nutrients, not the same way. So then the concept whole food plant-based came to mind. And that was, I, I published, on, I know as early as 85. I, I think I had something even before that to go back and look. But yeah, I, and now, and, and that, that kind of, that didn't, that didn't wasn't picking up or it wasn't picked up at that time. Uh, sorry about that. This phone here. That wasn't picked up at the time right away, but uh, it was in due course. And finally, I think it was about nineteen early nineteen nineties that, and I I was always I was saying whole food plant based, and everybody else is saying vegan or vegetarian. I mean, obviously, vegan vegetarian communities, great communities. They want to become a speaker stuff like that, <laughs> and it was a little bit awkward say, hey, I, I, I didn't get it for this reason. I mean, that's kind of no sense of making an argument where not, no argument exists. But uh, I also had to be true to myself. And uh, so, you know, we have a nice, rela I have a nice relationship with uh, vegetarian vegan groups. And, uh, but I, I also like to say that I came to it through the science and I, I, I go, the reason I make that point, it's kind of personal in a way is because if, if this movement is going to succeed and move forward, 
Yes, it may succeed with making the ethical argument. This, yeah, I don't understand that. Uh, it may succeed to some extent, but haven't been a policy at the national and international level so much. No, that's not going to sell uh, all that much. Uh, it's going to sell to people who aspire to, you know, the ethical argument. But in reality, if we look at the nutritional characteristics of vegan diets, they're not, that's not that great. Uh, you're still consuming a lot of uh, refined carbohydrates and fat, especially, especially for vegans. And vegetarians, 90% are still using dairy. So that's, that's why I can't, can't quite manage those words. Well, I, I do a spin off your plant based, and I tell people I'm plant exclusive. You what? I instead of plant based, I like to tell people I'm plant exclusive because based. Okay, that, that, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I worry yeah. based. You could still have a little other stuff, but if I'm plant exclusive, you know, it, when you were talking about whether or not your career was was compromised because of your beliefs, Julie says, as an academic, I was horrified to see how you were treated at your university. Has Cornell University updated their acceptance of your research? Uh, I think that what, what was the last sentence, what she said to Has Cornell University updated their acceptance of your research? No. And, uh, you know, I love you. I love Cornell. And just to prove that point, my immediate, our children and myself, we have seven degrees from Cornell. So I, I think, um, you know, a, a Cornellian, a true, true blue. But uh, on the one hand, I have to be honest, too, again, uh, the chairman of our department, to be specific, uh, in the later years, uh, was a, everybody knew this, he was a very substantial consultant for the dairy industry. And he is the one who pulled my class in the 1990s out of the catalog. And so three to 5,000 students signed a petition to get it reinstated, it wasn't re reinstated, right? Well, he was also a very powerful figure in Washington. He was the director of the Food and Nutrition Board. He was the chairman of the Dietary Guidelines Committee. And that's another story. I don't want to get into that here. But, but uh, on the campus, he started a movement, but he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. And then his successor did the same thing. And, and finally, I became uh, almost, almost, I guess you could say, persona non grata, as far as that group was concerned. A lot of great friends, great faculty at the university, but just those few individuals were corrupting our environment by their association with the industry, period. It's very, it's very serious. And that's why I made that point before about academic freedom. That, uh, you know, academia, I would say, uh, not just the Cornell, across the land, academia has been compromised on this question because academic freedom has been declining in recent years. And so in the more recent times, uh, they have been, and, and, uh, th there were two things uh, as far as my reputation at Cornell is concerned. One is that um, I, there's a, a communication department at Cornell. That's a great, it's a great department. They really, they, they uh, really did, uh, were very supportive of my work from, for God, 30 years continuously. It was, in fact, Carl Sagan and I were the two who supposedly had the biggest file, so I was told. But in any case, so we were flying high, everything's great with that department. But then finally, when we put our course online in, through a private foundation, you know, partnering with uh, the, the emerging uh, online program of the university, um, we, we did that and we surfaced as number one for some time, number one course. And then the uh, they wanted to write an article on me to talk about, to brag about this fact that our course had become number one out of a couple hundred courses. Uh, that was blocked. That was blocked. And it really was blocked officially by the president's office, who himself was a vegetarian. So why was he blocked? That's the question. I, I reminded him, I said, I think you're violating academic freedom. But he said he had to listen to his advisors. Who are his advisors? His advisor, the Dean of Agriculture, the head of our department, Nutritional Science, and so forth. So you see, it gets serious. And so then the book came out, the China study came out, and they like to list books. Even today, they've not listed, acknowledged the fact that the China study even exists. 
even though it's been translated to 50 languages that has sold 3 million copies. It doesn't exist. And then they had a picture of self faculty on the wall and uh, you know, the, all, all the faculty, my, my picture was removed. That's how far that some of these, uh, I can only say they're fools, some of the individuals who get caught up in this stuff. And but at the same time to be charitable, I guess you could say, or try to understand, they are operating within an environment. They're operating within an environment that's basically controlled. And I am very passionate about this. I want to tell the whole country, and I want to tell the whole country about academic. Uh, academia is a great place to work. I, you know, I love academia. But on the other hand, academia is being sold. It's being sold down the stream. And it's gotten worse in recent years, especially in area territories like nutrition or maybe pharmacology, which was another hat I was wearing. I was both in pharmacology and nutrition professionally. In pharmacology, the drug companies, they own, they own our, our wherewithal. In the nutrition areas, the livestock industry owns us. Or maybe the processed food uh, outfit. But in any case, uh, I, I'm, I'm just want to, you can quote me as much, much as you want on this here. I want to sound an alarm to the public. The academic freedom has declined in the last 40 years. We got real data on that. So now, now there's only, in 2011, the latest figures I had, only 9% of all academics had tenure and full professorships. I was one of the 9%. That was in 2011. It's gotten worse. I don't, I don't have any recent figures, but uh, the, there was an, an, an overt attempt to basically subvert universities and this academic freedom idea. And we could talk about it all day long. I've got real data to talk about, but uh, academic freedom has declined. And as a result, the public is not getting the truth you know, from the academics. They're just not getting the truth because they own the national policy guidelines as well. And uh, they, they essentially do. And so I, I, I'm really, you know, as I say, I could not be stronger in my, my views on this. I have lived it. I have seen it. I can talk about example after example after example. I spent about 20 years in national policy development on those committees, not only determining who gets the research and who doesn't, but also being on policy committees as well. So I've, I've seen it from A to Z. And uh, the public doesn't have a very good... Uh, I don't think the public has a very good impression from my point of view about science, quote unquote, whatever you want to call it. You know, but, but the public is correct to a great extent. I think they go overboard to so much that. But the public is thinking that, you know, sort of they want to believe that, you know, academics are involved in policy and all that sort of stuff, that they're experts. And as people, as persons, friends, yeah, everybody's trying their best. And I don't have any. I mean, they're next door neighbors, they're great people. But those who do not have tenure, if they want to keep their job, they've got to be careful. So now we have faculty, so-called faculty being hired as instructors, being underpaid, and they got it, they're maybe hired for a year or two or five or whatever it is. And if they if they stray stray stray, stray off the course, like I did, I can tell you. It's all over, but they're shouting. So who's got it? You know, how many people are in a position mid mid career, or in their younger lives, to speak up and what they really learn, what they find out? Well, I learned something I didn't believe in in the beginning, but I had to. You know, that's that's what gave me the the, the background to to speak as I did. And so I, I'm really anxious that. Actually, the public get this information once and for all. We got to change. Well, Michelle wants to know how do you not hold a grudge and how come you're not bitter? Yeah, you know, as I said before, I, I don't, I really don't. You know, may, may think I'm kind of odd, but I really don't because these are a few individuals who have, are very powerful in a sense. Uh, and, you know, they do get control of major departments and so forth and so on. 
but the fact of the matter is I, I say I was a benefactor of that nonsense. And so it allows me to come out and have some fun and tell the story. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't really hold a grudge against that as there were things denied I wish I could have had. Uh, probably the single most important thing that I think we lost was the extension to the China project. That was for an additional $7 million to go back to China and organize a, a program involving half a million people and doing it in a way in which uh, we could have learned a lot more. But that didn't happen. And then that's, that's a price. That's not a price that I just paid personally, but that's a price the public is paying. Because what we wanted to do was to collect blood samples from all these individuals. And the Chinese government was arranging for this. We're going to collect blood samples from 500,000 people every two years, store them in little aliquots. And then eventually when there was a sufficient number of cases of some particular disease that occurred, we could go back to those blood samples and we could trace, we could trace in the blood samples and exactly might, what, what might have changed you know, from the lab point of view, what might have changed to, to allow that person to become in whatever it is, to become infected or to get a disease. And, and I still think it was a great idea, but uh, now it's really not possible. We worked hard on that. And I actually went so far as, you know, we we're told we were awarded the money. I, can't, I went to Washington to get the money. And uh, the, the one institute brought a check for $200,000 down payment, put it on the table. Fine, I, I, that was the Cancer Institute, but there was a couple of other institutes who were going to participate, participate too. And they threw up a letter on the table that said, Campbell's a fraud. And it wasn't even signed. And they wanted to take that as their instrument to question my, my, uh, my honesty. And they, they won. They were able to do that. I guess I could have taken the court or gone to the newspapers or something of that sort, but I was too busy in doing doing other things. Uh, so, yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm but, but one more comment. I, I have to tell you, even though they will not say this necessarily, I'm speaking up for my fellow colleagues. Uh, they don't need to say anything whether they agree or disagree but I'm actually speaking up for that community of people, great people, you know, who, if we had total freedom, everybody had total freedom to have these kind of debates and discussions and so forth and so on, the public would gain all of my money, all the money I had, we got generous amounts of funding over the years. All of that came from the taxpayer. So here's a university deciding when they take in the money, they, they act like the bank and they dispense the money according to what we want to spend it on. So that's what works. They're, they're taking public money that I want totally 100% on my own and then decide, hey, you can't tell the public what you learned. That's what it comes down to. So, But don't they benefit from your, your course? Because it is eCornell. No, it's not. Yeah, that's right. Well, the course, yeah, I should say that. On the course, it was canceled. My class was canceled. So I fought that a bit and went through the right ropes and so forth. And at that time, there was a new program that the university was just adopting. It was an online program. And a lot of the faculty weren't very favorable to that. I was one of the 85% who was not in favor, to be honest, because we thought we should be teaching in the classroom. It was in the early days. And so uh, the, the, this new program, which was a private company, but wholly owned by Cornell, they were going to handle this online stuff. And so I was told, take it over the online thing. They thought they'd thrown me out to Siberia. So I took the course to the online operation and partnered, our foundation, our private nonprofit partnered with the uh, company Cornell owned, okay? That's what became our course. Now, over the years, it, it really has, that, that program has grown. And now I think that program has gotten a good reputation. A lot of universities have gotten into online teaching. And, uh, but now it's going back to the university again. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm well aware of that, but I, we, we've come too far. And so I think that everything will be fine. Um, and there, now there's some people that, especially the students, since I left my formal teaching on the campus, I'm still emeritus. I have all the privileges of a faculty member, 
uh, I've been invited each year since I, I stopped the formal teaching by students, large numbers of students to come back to speak. And uh, that was a bit of a challenge for, for a little while with some of the students, but uh, the students have been fantastic. And of course, they were, I just spoke recently to, even in this, uh, what do you call it, virtual learning process, a bunch of students got together and I spoke to that group of people. I don't know how many were, was, I forget what the number was, but. So the students, and that's the other, that's the other group of people, the people who are not getting a fair shake in, this, in a case like I'm talking about, are the students and their families who pay the money for them to go to school. So I love the students. That was, that was my life, you know, working with students, especially graduate students, undergraduate graduates both. And uh, they've gone off and done gotten good careers for themselves. I've given a number of lectures wherever they've gone. I've been invited to, uh, to their universities or other places. Well, so Daria is saying that you should get a Nobel Prize for your lifelong work. Well, I don't, I don't know about that, but you know, I, I, I'm really anxious that, that the truth be told in this field. Nutrition is, as you know, you, you, you know you're, you've had your own experiences. Uh, that you, you know it works. You know it works by eating only plants. For whatever reason, we all may have gotten into it. You know, it's sort of, it's, that's, that's a personal interest, but still, the, the idea is sound regardless of who we may be or what we think, it's really sound. And uh, I think the most recent illustration of a problem is the COVID experience. This, uh, this stuff that we're all a bit concerned about, this crisis we're now living in. And uh, I think that's, uh, I, I, sorry, I, I'm sort of front and center with an idea at the moment because we have, and I'm, I'm uh, it's, it's, I'm just in the process of now sort of getting this out there, but we actually had data in China from a China study. And that, for those who don't know, we did this big study in China that involved eventually 170 villages and 8,900 people, adults and so forth and so on, collected all kinds of information. And uh, looking back, we had information on, a, on four viruses in China, one of which we studied in some detail. And looking back at that information, it's very clear that, uh, in fact, it's more than clear, it's that we have the statistical information on this, that um, there's a nutrition component to this coronavirus story. And the nutrition component is not paid too much attention to. Right now, most people, if you listen to even scientists, I have to say, but these are scientists who haven't been trained in nutrition, so they're not aware of it either. But uh, most people think that a viral disease like uh, coronavirus is not going to be influenced by, you know, something like we're talking about, right? I say wrong, really wrong. And there's, there's not enough information around. We had information in China to show that people who consume the most plants had greater amount of antibodies, period. Highly, highly significant. At the same time, most of the people who are dying from this disease are older. They've been compromised by having the wrong nutrition during their lives. So they've got heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so forth and so on. They're the ones most susceptible to the coronavirus problems. And so this whole food prep that works at two levels from the data we have. And it's really good data. Some of it's been published. The, 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 the whole food plant based diet, if I can use those words, actually will actually re reverse in many cases, as you know, people who do have the diabetes, who do have the heart disease, hopefully do have the cancer maybe. It'll reverse that and do it pretty fast. You know, with diabetes, you probably know the story. I mean, Neil Bernard and some others have done this. If people go on that, on this diet, the diabetics, type two diabetics, their use of insulin drops so fast that if they don't uh, decrease the dosage of the insulin they're taking, they can go into hypoglycemic shock. That's how powerful the diet is. And it happens within days, to be honest about it. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that 
the evidence we have in our study in China involving a different virus is a more serious virus, if you can believe it. It's a virus that causes cancer. It may, in fact, it may be the most significant virus in the history of the world. It's a very serious virus. And so we uh, working with the hepatitis B virus and people say, oh, that's hepatitis B. That's not, that's not a coronavirus. And I have to back them up on that because every strain of virus has its own sort of collection of symptoms. We, we understand that. It ranges from serious symptoms in the lung, in the coronavirus case maybe, to ranges to cancers, to you know, a variety of different things. So all these different viruses, they're very specific for the kind of symptoms they may cause, but they're all common in one sense. When they infect a host, the host reacts by defending itself. That's true for all of them, essentially. And they use their immune system to do that. And so what operates more or less to one virus, as far as the immune system is concerned, it's the same immune system, essentially. It's a very complex system, but nonetheless, the reaction is going to be to try to get rid of that virus, period. And so the whole food plant-based diet and the data we have from China, first off, this is liver cancer in this case we're talking about, Basically, doing that gets these older folks, like myself, get these people back off onto a good nutritional basis and are less susceptible to the virus. That's one thing. Secondly, they actually form more antibodies. That's what our data show. And so I think, I think this may be a moment in time when uh, the whole story about um, nutrition, I'd like to think it was nutrition, but in this case, uh, nutrition provided by, you know, the whole food plant-based diet, uh, this may be a time, AJ, when we can really start talking about the extraordinary property of this kind of nutrition. Um, and uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, Dr. Campbell, would you like to show your slides? Would you like to take questions? But before, if you don't mind, I'd like to share one thing with the, the audience. I think they, they know you're very uh, serious about your work, but I don't think people realize that you also have a wonderful sense of humor. And I don't know if you remember this, but we actually met a little over 10 years ago when you spoke at Loma Linda and I was hired by Dr. Hans Deal to chef the meal that you were there. And we started you know, e emailing each other and I had emailed you to tell you the story about a friend of mine that was in the hospital for colon cancer for the second time and he was having surgery and we asked him if we could bring him anything and he said McDonald's. Well, as somebody who's been an ethical vegan, I wouldn't do that anyway. But what we did is we did get a hold of a McDonald's bag and we put the book, The China Study, in the bag and then left it with him. And I told you that story and I'm reading this email from March 12, 2010. And this is what you wrote me back. You wrote, super, actually the book's paper does have some fiber and this is said to reduce colon cancer occurrence. That probably would have worked. <laughs> 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 so I just want people to know that you you do have a very good sense. I, I put on I put on uh, ten years worth of age. Yeah. Well, what, what do you hope your legacy will be? I mean, the thing that's so great is your all your children are in, in. I just met your granddaughter, who's a nurse. I mean, they're carrying on the family tradition. But you know, I think that there's so many people that aren't appreciated and proven right until after they're gone. Like like uh, Semmelweis. You know, remember the guy who told that yeah. you had. So you have to wash hands. That's why uh, children are dying and mothers are dying in childbirth. And he was laughed at and scoffed. And so there are people that, that later on become icons. So what do you hope your legacy will be with, with your body of work and what your life has been? Well, that's for other people to determine. I, I don't want to direct or thank you know this. Uh, but in, in reality, um, I, I just, I don't, I don't know if it's been, a, uh, maybe it's this. I, I want to elevate science you know, to something that it should have been once once was more or less. I want to elevate it to a really a, a classy career in many ways, whether you're participating in the laboratory or whatever, you know, at that level or doing research. Uh, I want young people to think about that this really is a, an opportunity. I, I'm sad to say it's not quite. I wish it were, you know, better opportunities. 
uh, and in the area of nutrition, uh, I actually, you know, probably, and many people listening will know that nutrition is not taught in medical schools. Not one school in the country, not one medical school, not the way that I'm talking about. It might be some classes in a few, uh, few uh, universities here and there, but uh, I wish that medical schools really would pick up the task of teaching us something that matters. Uh, it's not even one of the 140, whatever it is, 130, I think, the 130 medical specialties uh, that uh, uh, you know, we live by and doctors are reimbursed by. Uh, of the 130 medical specialties, not one is dedicated to nutrition. So yeah, I, I just want this information to get out there. If I can leave behind something like that. Uh, and really, I, I know the effect it would have on you know, our societies, I think would be major. And right now, we, there's one area that we all know about, may be the biggest one of all. And that's the effect of the food that we choose to eat. The effect that that decision has on in the environment. We can forget about all these other discussions and arguments, so forth and so on. The planet has to survive. And now things are changing very fast. And so uh, we need to make changes now, tomorrow, today. And the cost of health care, if it weren't for the environment, there was another one. The cost of health care is through the roof. And the reason we have, is that so is because we use more pharmaceuticals than any, any country in the world. You know, by far. Yet at the same time, we're using pharmaceuticals to give us health and not talking about nutrition because doctors aren't trained in that. They can't get reimbursed for that. Nutrition is one heck of a lot more significant than use of drugs, depending on drugs. And there are estimates, and these are really uh, pretty strong estimates. Estimates that uh, the deaths that arise from the use of drugs is the third leading cause of death in the United States, just between heart disease and cancer. The third, but the CDC, the government's agency, doesn't even list it in their top 10 diseases of causes of death. How do you like that? I mean, sweeping something under the rug? That's what they're doing. They've been doing that since 1992 when this was first published by a woman by the name of Barbara Starfield at Johns Hopkins, been now sort of examined several times since then. And if anything, um, the data have become even more striking. So we live on drugs and we operate that kind of system. Uh, it's not to say that drugs are good, they are. We, I mean, we, we have times when, when they're useful, that's not the issue. But to, to so be so dependent on them instead of on food is a travesty of the worst kind. It's really ridiculous. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And I feel like, especially with this resurgence of the keto diet and the carnivore diet, even if it was healthy, which we know it isn't, it's a very selfish diet. You betcha. There is a, well, they get away with it in part because the first, uh, the first things that happen when they start that, if they're overweight, they're gonna lose some weight, you know, because their calorie intake goes go down and so forth. Um, and also, incidentally, there's some evidence that not much, but the serum cholesterol levels may drop a bit. That impresses some people, you know, who go on this keto diet, if you will. Those are short-term things. And that's enough to really get people excited about it who are wanting to lose weight and do this and that. But that's not a lifetime. And most of them fortunately quit it before too long but it's really a really a very superficial sad story would you like to show your slides dr campbell uh yeah i talked about it quite a bit we can we can try that um hey, not you sure. hit the share screen button and guys thank you so much for being here i'm sorry if i'm not getting to your questions as you know when we have this many people watching live the feed goes very fast it keeps about okay comments and then it disappears, but hopefully we can get Dr. Campbell okay, back. So do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, what I'm going to do, just a couple of them here, just for those who might not be bigger. Okay, here's an early, this was an early study that we did way back in the, was published, it shows there, this is much later, uh, but the early version of this was published, you know, essentially in about the late 70s. If you feed animals, 
protein at two different levels, 20% of total calories shown here. And you watch the growth of cancer over the first 12 weeks, the 20% of calories, which is on the high end, uh, the cancer is growing well. If you feed 5%, they don't, even though they both are susceptible, equally susceptible to cancer. But then if you alternate the diet during that time, you get this. Cancer grows fast the first three weeks. Take the other diet, turns it off, turns it on, turns it off. That right there was a, uh, that lasted that observation in those, those days because what it showed is that uh, nutrition is in control of disease formation in large measure. In this case, it's essentially almost totally in control. Um, I mean, and, but yet on the other hand, the Cancer Institute says it's genetic disease. And I, I, I show this here because uh, cancer has always been considered to be a, a genetic disease. This is the first line on the web page of the National Cancer Institute of NIH. And this is the, this is the institute that actually put a lot of my stories, studies. Uh, this, uh, what this says here is that because cancer is genetic disease, in other words, stars are genes, corrupt the genes in this particular case. Uh, so the stars are genes, then because mutations can't go backwards, more or less, it takes a mutated gene, since they can't come backwards naturally, very rare, uh, then the only way you can treat cancer, the only way you can really treat cancer is to kill the cancer cells. That's really what is the basis for using uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and surgery, is to kill the cancer cells. When in reality, we know from more than a couple hundred years, cancer is more than that. Uh, but we can't even study nutrition. So doctors aren't trained nutrition. Just, I make that point because I think that's an interesting one. I'm going to skip around here a little bit, just real quick. Here, here's another one uh, at the time that I wrote the, uh, the China study with my son. Um, we were exploring the literature to see if there was any evidence in the literature, sort of saying something similar to what was in the book. And yeah, we got all these diseases listed. So I, I say this diet works as it has a very broad effect. It's very rapid. I mentioned before, it takes just a few uh, days, maybe. My son Nelson um, has, has been doing this uh, kind of thing quite, quite a lot, actually. Um, and he sees these kind of changes. Very, it's in the film, Plant Pure Nation. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I think it's on Amazon, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, here's the dietary, if it's sustained. Now we can turn to talk about the big, there's a big ticket item in my view. We were talking about this diet or nutrition, you know, preventing disease. Yeah, it does that. But a big, I think the big observation that we could talk about is the fact that people already have the disease, you know, thanks to uh, our colleagues in this field, especially, people already have the disease. If they're switched to this diet, it happens so fast. And it usually happens without side effects. That's nice to know. Here, I'm going to show you now the next slide here. Here's a, a research of others back in the, what is it, 80s, 70s, and so forth, back, back to the 50s, actually, showing the relationship between animal protein intake and various cancer mortality rates. Here's one that shows a straight line relationship that uh, you, can, you can see on the straight line relationship. There's a bunch of different countries. The higher the animal protein intake, the higher the cancer mortality rate, in this case for breast cancer. See a straight line? That straight line in theory is going right through zero. That means as soon as we put a little animal protein in the diet, we in theory are starting to elevate risk. We saw the same thing in that uh, inf information in, the, in China on the COVID thing. Just a little bit of animal protein can cause problems. There is a plant protein that doesn't do it. That one's third, third one there is breast cancer incidence. These different things, uterine cancer, colon cancer, renal cancer prostate cancer, heart disease, a couple of them. These are, these are all publications of others. I just wanted to show that because I'm going to skip this here. I, I want to get, we don't have a lot of time left. Here, here's my definition of nutrition. It's basically holist. It's, it really involves the use of all the nutrients uh, in the food at the time it's being consumed. We should consume it together. And of course, food can be cooked. has nothing to do with it, with that. And it's what I'm talking about that when we eat whole food, I'm just merely talking about you know, eating the whole food substance itself and eating all these nutrients together. It can be diced and sliced and cooked and so forth and so on. 
Uh, and it, it, when, when you get to that particular point in time, uh, you, you, you don't add, add back in theory, it's a whole food form. So I say it's the how to interact with integrated whole system minus the cult of animal protein. I do want to make a point here, um, AJ, on this one here. Uh, I, I'm really wedded to this idea that and this is what the science we have. The whole food plant-based thing is where it's at. And people follow the simple, just two rules, eat whole food and eat plant-based. They're going to gain, I would say, at least 90 to 95% of the health that they wish to have. Uh, just that simple thing. They don't need to think about all the others. That addresses one more point here, though. And that's when we add back uh, uh, certain substances of food, even though they may come from plant food, you know, like refined sugar or added oil or whatever. You know, we, we take out of these, these foods the individual things, and when we add that back, uh, it's not good in a lot of cases, especially the added oil. But then it wants me to bring to one more point I want to make. Added oil is, I totally agree with the sentiment in the, in the community. We try to try to avoid that uh, as much as possible. But on the other hand, uh, I do want to register my, my thoughts on this, that the oil that may be present in certain plant foods like nuts, avocado, and so forth, uh, I don't see really any evidence, not from the scientific point of view, any evidence that that's really, that's really not good. We obviously would don't need to you know, eat, the day, eat that, that kind of food all day long like nothing else. But I do want to draw a distinction between um, you know, the, the diet that is whole food plant-based as opposed to the one that maybe adds back something to sweeten it up or add some oil, which is an addictive kind of thing that we desire. But a little bit of uh, something to flavor things. And I, that's another, oh yeah, I didn't put that here, but ethnic cuisines and other kinds of foods that we can dress it up with some flavors. And I don't see any problem with that either. We can ma maintain ethnic cuisines this way. Uh, every, uh, Every society sort of has its own sort of favorites, flavors, and and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, a little nuts, for example, eat along with that. My view is no problem, but you're not by not because it, the nuts, for example, are whole food, and they really have antioxidants and fiber and good stuff. So I say here's two dietary goals. Just that is enough to. Medicine, on the other hand, is reductionist. One disease, one cause, one mechanism. We think that way, we treat people that way, and that's exactly the opposite. I'm going to skip this right here. Just I want to, I want to get over to. Um, I'll get a new book, by the way. I want to, I want to Wait, there's a new this. book. You can tell us. Pardon? Yeah. I, 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 okay. There's that that book there uh, did well. It's still doing well. So New York Times bestseller. I'm telling they are the more theoretical characteristics of my kind of thinking, if you look at least me these views. Uh, this one's a new one coming out this uh, year. Just finished uh, probably uh, writing it with my grandson, uh, Nelson Campbell Disla, as our daughter's son. Um, graduate University of North Carolina in uh, literature. He got the big prize at the university at the end of the graduation. He's a really excellent writer. But here's, what, here's the title. The future of nutrition. And insiders look at the science, why we keep getting it wrong and how to start getting it right. And I'm just telling you that that story going back in history, quite frankly, back to the 1700s. And seeing, I did that, had a chance when I spent a year at Oxford University back in the 80s. And uh, that was a lesson and a half. That I, There was so much in the history that's been forgotten. And so, I can see now, looking at that history, what it, what we once thought was good health, how that got distorted, how certain ideas got laid aside or or uh, diminished, if you will, it wasn't going along with the standard way of thinking. And so we have what we have now because we allowed that to happen over the last 150 years. And that's the story I tell, how we could get it, you know, how we can get it right, if you will. Excited about that. Let me uh, here. Here, I'm just uh, this COVID thing, uh, just to illustrate this point because I think it's really important. This is work, as I said, we did in China, and it's on the hepatitis model in this case. Uh, let's say there's a 
out there in the public, there's this hepatitis uh, virus. Uh, it's an antigenic form, so we call it HBSAG, antigenic. It sort of invades the host that comes in. It's landing in the body at this point in time. Uh, maybe it hasn't caused symptoms yet. It's asymptomatic, but it's there. We test positive. Uh, and then that has, it, it can go in two different ways. Either it can go to give liver cancer, and it's a very potent promoter of liver cancer. That's the symptoms. Or it can be deactivated, if you will. That's what the body's doing with it, trying to get rid of it. And uh, they make some antibodies. Two courses. Which way does it go? Okay. Let's look at some results here. In that study in China, we measured antigen prevalence, antibody prevalence, liver cancer, if you will, and a bunch of different nutritional factors. And here's what we actually got out of it. Well, I'd like to ask the question, what kind of nutrition favors virus immunity? So here, it's a little bit complicated, maybe. It's about the simplest I can make it. I'm listening here only to the statistically significant associations, statistically significant, okay? So it's just taking the cream off the, off the top. And the first line here, I'm talking about animal food, how it favors on one hand, live virus, that's it. That is to say, these things here below, uh, they're associated with liver cancer, formation of antigen, higher cholesterol levels, even though it was low, very low protein. I, I didn't think there was enough protein to do any damage. But there you have it, animal food favors a live virus. And it, with the arrow coming down, if you look, if I get my pointer here, you know, it's over here, see, when they're dead, ruined the story here. <laughs> so the animal protein is increasing antigen that's keeping the virus active, okay? Now it can cause liver cancer, not, not good. You can see it there. How the hell is it significant? But also depressing the formation of antibody, that's what makes us immune. In animal food, with those degree, degrees of statistical significance, there's a pretty, for my way of looking at the thing is amazing because as I say, the animal food is only about 10% of what it is in the West. But even that little bit of animal food was associated with a depression of antibody formation. Okay, so let's go one more step. Oh, okay. Okay, now we're going to go. That was animal food. Now we're going to talk about plant food. Plant food, and now it has the opposite effect. Notice here. It uh, depresses the active virus. It causes it to go from the active form to the inactive form. Okay, so the plant food is doing this. And over in the antibody, plant food, vegetables, just consuming vegetables, highly, highly significant with the formation of more antibodies. You know, it's, of course, that's not, it's, that's not a direct test of the idea that we might want to do. In fact, I don't think we can really do that kind of study. But this evidence is really strong. Eight plants, form antibodies, get rid of the virus, pretty simple. There, there you see it, just there, more or less. Antigens. The plant food pushes the antigen toward antibody formation and then activates it. Animal foods, it keeps it still in the active form. Okay, I don't think I'll get into this here because uh, we, we took this back to, I will tell this. This is a mouse model. These are liver sections. In this particular case, um, they were all three of the, these groups here were exposed to the virus. The virus is there, and, uh, and they were fed three different levels of protein. One group, they were fed low protein. Even though they had the virus, the, the cancer didn't form. No black smudges in there. There was a little cells there, but, but when they had the highest protein, you see all that early cancer forming? Didn't take long. The high protein turned on the development of cancer in this hepatitis uh, model. The low protein did not, intermediate form of some. So what the animal protein does, just like it did in the human study, the environmental chemical studies I showed earlier, the high animal protein really turns on the cancer, whether it started by a virus in this case, or whether it started by, um, by chemical in the previous case. So now we'll put this here and say, okay, what does this have to do with the COVID thing? Here's what I'm saying. Here's my, my projection, my hypothesis, whatever my, people want to call it. My best guess in this case, is the COVID starts out with an antigen floating around out there in the, oops, gosh, sorry about that. 
I go backwards. So the uh, the antigen is here. Okay, it comes in and, and it, it invades us. Now we test positive for the antigen. Okay, we don't have the symptoms yet, we test positive. Now it's going to take some days or maybe a couple of weeks before it causes this dirty work. You become asymptomatic. But in any case, now it's in the body. The whole food based diet would, would in this hypothesis, just like the other virus, force it to form antibodies. The whole food plant based diet in this case here would block this. Now, how how can how can we not accept this kind of information? This is this is uh, statistically significant. It's really what nature does. It does it not just with this particular case here. It does it, of course, across the board. We all know this. It, it does it with these uh, diseases that we have. So, in this case here, it's being blocking the formation of the symptoms of the COVID virus in this model, making more antibodies. So one more step here. This is really significant too. Most of the people getting, they're susceptible to the coronavirus. Uh, basically, they're over 60 years of age and they've been having a poor diet. 95% of them have poor nutrition, which comes from eating the wrong food. And so they have diabetes and and uh, cancer and heart disease and stroke and so forth and so on. They got risk, all the risk factors, they're up here. So what do you, would you expect to happen in this case? It turned before I answer that question. Here we have uh, those who are uh, having these diseases, older age, they're already now, you know, not so well off with uh, ill health. They now are the source of all the comorbidity that occurs in a coronavirus situation. These are the people who have already been compromised for not eating the right food, right? They got the poor nutrition. They're susceptible to getting the viral diseases. Let's add more one more wrinkle, to try to make it clear. The whole food plant-based diet blocks the formation of the degenerative disease in the first place, okay? And also it blocks the viral disease from expressing themselves, basically. It's, uh, we showed that in the in the laboratory. So this is it's a win-win situation. And the fact that we know that this diet actually works on people within a day or two or three, certainly in a week, holy crow. I mean, I, I don't see why this isn't just, this, this is, but you know, it, it, people don't know this, of course. And so that's why I'm wanting to get it out there. What, what we're now relying on, and this is germane to this comment, what we tend to re, uh, rely on in this COVID uh, crisis and worry about uh, is that, you know, what we worry about, you know, getting the disease, obviously, we, we're very careful about that. But on the other hand, uh, we're relying on something that, in my mind, should be questioned. We're relying on, oh, someday it's going to come. We're going to have a, we're going to have a treatment here pretty soon. If we listen to places like the White House, my God, it's already here. But in any case, we're waiting for a drug to come along to kill the disease, reverse the diseases. It's a very simplistic idea, but anyway, that's what we're waiting on that. Uh, we're also waiting on the development of a immune or a, a vaccine. Well, vaccines are specific for each strain of virus, as I said before. They may last only, some of these immunities may last for a year or two. Some of them last for a lifetime. That's why you get immunized. Uh, so we don't know how long it's going to last, but in any case, if we, and, and every, uh, every uh, vaccine that's invented is usually specific for that virus that comes along. And if it's going to take a year and a half or whatever it is, a year, year and a half, two years to get the vaccine that works for each virus that comes along and, and these flus are, these viruses and diseases are occurring at more and more frequency Pretty soon we're going to, when, when the second virus comes along, we haven't even learned what vaccine to use for the first one. And so it goes. I'm just predicting for the future. As long as we rely on the model of, of uh, relying on the use of uh, chemicals to kill that virus, and at the same time rely on the development of immunity, artificially created, if you will, as long as we're relying on that particular model, to see us through for the future, forget it. Especially if these viral diseases are coming along at a faster rate and there is evidence for that. 
So all I'm saying is that I think, I think in this case, we got something to shed some light on as far as the coronavirus situation is concerned. Uh, it's time that we start making our minds up. Do we want to take nutrition seriously? That which is provided by whole food plant-based diet or not? Do we want to live with the model that we now have? You know, getting, uh, do contact tracing, putting on masks, standing in lines six feet apart, shutting schools down, shutting industries down. Come on, that, that, that is, I, I just feel like we're in, a, we're in a state now that the crisis has been fixed. It's here. And about all I can hear people talking about these days from the authorities is a possibility if we can just hang around and up and you know stay out of people's way, we're going to get a, we're going to get drugs sooner or later. We're going to get a vaccine. And I'm saying those two courses of action are fraught with danger. They're not nearly as promising as what people would like to have you believe. First. And secondly, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Uh, before uh, and before that time arrives, when we have that, we might have another virus coming along. I, I, I think we're looking like that really like a dark tunnel. And so here we are in the crisis stage. We're in the crisis stage now. Now's the time to learn, to go back and actually sort of ask some questions about science, real science, not just the science, kind of science that enables us to predict when the when the uh, whole epidemic is going to end or whether there's going to be a second wave. That, that's a useful information, I, I confess. But that's not, that's not the kind of science that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the science that operates at the biological level that uh, really is of significance here. So there you have it. Also, incidentally, the whole food plant-based diet is not a one-time thing. You don't eat it. Okay, I'm going to eat it now. I'm going to get better here in the next you know, I won't have the problems maybe for a few days, a couple weeks or so, and I'll go back. No, can't do that. Because now there's evidence that uh, some of these, I don't know whether this is faulty methodology or not, but there's some evidence that may be true that the immunity that is created is not lasting very long and people will get reinfected again. All the more important, a big argument, if, there, if, this, if this nutrition works as I think it will, and I want to emphasize as I think it will, as I hypothesize, say what, what we want, I think the evidence is, is there for us to think about and use. But we got to stay with it. It's got to be a habit. Okay, I'm, and I'm going to quit there, uh, AJ. Um, I don't want to show more than that. Dr. Campbell, you're... Your new book will come out in December of this year. Yeah, I'm sorry, I went over, didn't I? Oh my God, yeah. That's okay, Dr. Campbell. Listen, you can go as long as you want and or you can always come back because there were a lot of questions. So we don't, we, believe me, nobody is complaining that you went over. I promise you that. They're very hanging on every word. Do you, but I, I do want to respect your time though and I would love you to come back and maybe answer some of these questions. But would it be all right if I asked you just kind of one fun question? Yes, give me two minutes, okay? I'll be back. Oh, you're leaving. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> no, 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 hey, no, I can't, no, I said I'm just leaving for two minutes. I'll be back. back. <laughs> I'll talk to them. Okay. <laughs> I've never had that happen before. So, guys, two minutes. I'll, um, just just give me a second to explain some things to you guys. And again, I know that not everybody watches every broadcast, nor should you. It's just that I want you to really understand that if I don't answer your, ask your question of whoever the guest is, it's not that I don't like you or like the question or I'm ignoring you. One of the things I have to explain with this restream technology is you are watching in one of five places. So while you may say, well, I don't understand. It's only showing, you know, a hundred people here. Why can't she get to my question? You have to multiply that by five. There could be 400 or 500 watching on one of my private groups. And so what is happening is like a ticker tape in the stock market, what you are typing, it goes very fast. And, and the screen only allows me to see about 10 comments at once. And then they're gone. So what I, what I try to, I don't want to be sitting there shooting with my phone. What I try to do is I try to write things down, but that's what happens. And so that's why we ask people to 
to submit the questions in advance. Now, the questions that were submitted in advance for Dr. Campbell, unfortunately, most of them were medical questions. He is not a medical doctor. Yeah, maybe he is going to the restroom. I figured he didn't want to say that, Mauricio. So, so that is what, what happens with this technology. You're seeing it on 20% on of where it's, it's airing. So it's not a YouTube live. It's not a Facebook live per se. It's going to all these places. So I hope you can understand that. And so he's back. Great. So Dr. Campbell, one of the things that the viewing audience always wants to know is what our guests eat and how they exercise. But someone named Keisha sent in a question in advance for you that's a little bit different. And she said, can you please ask Dr. Colin Campbell, does he have cheat days for holidays and birthdays? And if so, what are some of his favorite cheat foods? Uh, no, I don't. I can really say that honestly. Uh, there was a while. Uh, when, before we were totally changed when I would like to cheat a little bit on some cheese cubes when my wife wasn't looking. Uh, but anyhow, no, not now, really. Uh, and, and I don't feel the need to do that uh, because, you know, I, I don't like the food. I don't like that fat food. I've, I've lost the taste for, you know, the high fat stuff or the high oil and the stuff with sugar and I don't want to eat, and the and eggs I used to eat and dairy and stuff like I don't want it taste. I couldn't eat it. Period. So I don't have your cheat foods. Sorry, I went away to go grab your book. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I actually ran away for a minute to grab your book because I this is this is uh, as great as the China study was. This book is is equally as good. It's it's different, of course. But what I love about this book is you say something on page what is it? Page seven, and it's almost like this paragraph that you say. You almost don't even need a book. It, it you say the ideal human diet looks like this. Consume plant foods in forms as close to their natural state as possible. Whole foods, eat a variety of vegetables, fruits, raw nuts and seeds, beans and legumes and whole grains. Avoid heavily processed food and animal products and stay away from added salt, oil, sugar. Aim to get 80% of your calories from carbohydrates, 10% from fat and 10% from protein. That's it in 66 words. In this book, I call it the whole food plant-based diet. I mean, what, what, I mean, all these, what more do we need than that paragraph, really? Yeah, well, it was one part of that, uh, AJ. Uh, I, I know you, I was listening carefully, trying to catch up on what I, what I wrote some time ago, but I said, uh, avoid, I think I've used the word avoid. I got to hear someplace. Avoid, uh, you know, the salt, sugar, and what is it? Salt, oil, sugar. Okay. Uh, away from added uh, salt, oil, and sugar. Yeah, I, I, want, I want to make a comment about that because there's some, some argument about that and I would like to weigh in here a little bit uh, and from the scientific point of view in large measure. Uh, namely, uh, people, you know, I like to make decisions when I could look at data that's published, real, it's been tested, all that sort of stuff. I, I can't operate just on the basis of personal experience or, or that sort of thing. And I don't know any evidence that, you know, adding a, a little bit of... Uh, no, so I mean, I, I've so I've talked to my good friend, uh, <laughs> asked him a bit about this. Uh, nuts, I use them. Some people might want to call that uh, cheat food. I don't consider it cheat food, and uh, because there is a, a again, this is published evidence. You know, put a little bit of that in there, and and I think we can get the same results with some of that. So the oil that may be present in whole food, a little, you know, you don't overdo it. And so I, I just like to set things as a goal. The word for me is goal. It's not a, a, a fixed firm, you know, you're going to die if you don't do it this way, because I don't know of uh, any scientific evidence to argue otherwise. So I do like to, I do want to make that point. It's really, it's really pretty critical. The same as for sugar. In, in that case, people are arguing, don't eat any fruit. It's got sugar, it's got sugar. No, I don't, I don't buy that. That's, that's crazy because I don't know of any evidence that you know, that kind of sugar is there. When, that's why I, I did eating a whole food is all working together. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, okay, enough said. <laughs> right, well, like you always say, it's a symphony, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, Dr. Campbell, I'd love to have you back, especially when your book comes out so we can promote it and get as many people to get it as possible so you can have another New York Times bestseller. Oh, well, okay. That's good. 
I, I did all the talking. You let me do all the talking here. I, well, I, this is this is what, what what do I have to say? I see. I feel like a broken record. I say I say the same thing all the time. So we have a physician watching. Oh God, these goes. Doctor Daryl Woodruff says this is by far the best presentation you have presented in the past couple months. The other ones are good too, but this one really stands out. That's because when you have a class act, what do you expect? Anytime you'd like to talk to anybody, I mean, I'd be happy to just. I, I'm the techie, Dr. Campbell, you're the star. So you please come on anytime you have something to say. And, you know, I, you know, I have not met your daughter yet, but I have a couple of her books. It, would she be somebody that would maybe like to come on and talk or, and maybe even make some of her recipes? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to brag about her. <laughs> to be honest about it. Uh, no, she, she got her uh, doctorate in education. She was in the Peace Corps. So she used that sort of uh, that pathway. Uh, she uh, she did her a Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic, and ever since that's like thirty years ago now, and uh, she'd been living a lot or going there a lot over the years, and she's taken down American students to have an experience in a country like that. It's back in the mountains, uh, and now she has a place and she's got some land and she's uh, got a thing going there now to demonstrate. It's fantastic. It demonstrates what food can do. To the not eating right food could do to the environment. For example, there's a field right next to her where her place is uh, that used to be all forest. There was water in a stream going down like eight feet deep, I'm told. And in those just a few short years, they cut the, the, the trees down, the water sort of dried up, and they cut it down to feed cattle. And they destroyed that, created a microclimate that in turn caused uh, the cacao uh, crop. To go downhill and a lot of people became extremely poor it's a whole nine yards of what a food right there in a, a microcosm if you will a whole, just showing you know what food can do to an environmental situation involving loss of water trees and so now she's got some other land she's building planting a lot of mango trees and banana uh, trees or whatever and uh, so she's now involved with our online course in a major way, sort of the strategy person, sort of directing a lot of that. So yeah, she's she's a good speaker too. Well, maybe you could hook me up with her and because people have been asking, has your course changed at all throughout the years? Yeah, it did. Um, yeah, we're gonna have a new, we have, we got a new course by the way, coming up. It's, uh, I'm just looking at the final version of it, my wife and I right now. Uh, it's coming up and it's going to be a course on food and some food sustainability. You know, just a full nine yards uh, of doing three courses, making a certificate program out of it. That sounds terrific. Uh, Tisha said, how many kids do we have? We know about Tom, we know about Nelson, and we know about Leanne, but isn't there, a, are there more? Yeah, there's two more. Uh, we have another son, they're all into this. Uh, we have one son who uh, is a teacher, a special ed teacher. Uh, and uh, he works with younger kids with needs special attention, and and uh, he's had me speak to the school community, the board, and stuff like that. He's really into this. Uh, and then the other son uh, is a computer whiz, and uh, he is uh, now just he's into it too, big time. <laughs> he uh, he's uh, working from home for a company out of England, and uh, he's he's been talking about you know creating a model he's very excited about to use a, a computer platform to uh, le learn some things. Our grandson, our oldest son's son, Kim, Kim and Nelson's son, his name is mine, Colin, Colin Campbell. He's got a new, uh, and his sister was one you, you may have seen, but it's, uh, Colin's one who uh, really got into the computers too. And he's uh, created a platform for that, that, that pod concept. You know about the pods? Yes, the plant-based pods. A lot of people on are actually leaders of it. That's right. I mean, there's uh, 400 pods, I think, and there's something like 200 and some thousand people have registered, and it's kind of getting off the ground still, but it's really, uh, it's very exciting. And uh, I was just speaking to a group in, uh, a, a group of economists in uh, Athens, Greece, uh, just this week, earlier this week, and uh, they, they know, know about the pods, and I was, uh, we, I think the pods are, I believe, in something like 22 countries around the world, and now they've got a jumpstart program just going, too worldwide and so uh yeah and then colin is the one who created that that uh, platform that will be used so they all can speak to each other and you know and so forth and participate that's 
cool. Mm -hmm. any, any of the Campbells that want to come on, whether they cook or talk, you just hook me up with them. We would love to meet them. Jeannie's asking if the new course you're offering, is it going to be the same as the way the, the traditional course is offered through eCornell? Yeah. Yeah. You go to the, go to the website. As soon as it's announced, we'll, we'll have that out here shortly. Uh, yeah, same deal. We have uh, online instructors, you know, the, the feedback that goes on and taking some tests, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and we got a lot of a uh, lot of uh, uh, guest speakers who uh, have been in this environmental thing. And the person who really put that uh, together, that all the information, the original information, is another grandson. It's the one who's uh, our daughter's son, Stephen Diesler. Right. You know, I'm having a hard time saying goodbye because I love you so much and so do the people. I don't want to ever disconnect and nobody's dropping off. But I thought of one question and I don't know if you've ever been asked this, but you know how people in, in like in show business, like a lot of times they're most proud of a certain performance they've given. And I know in my career, I like when I spoke at the McDougal event study weekend of all the talks I gave, that was the most meaningful. You've spoken to probably millions of people by now. D do you have like one memory of like just like the, the best presentation you've given or the best experience giving the information that you're giving? Oh, gosh. Um, I have to say the Plan Nutrition Congress or Plan, Plan Nutrition Project uh, is one, the first time that was offered. Uh, and I've spoken each time there. I, I like that group. Uh, and the ACLM group, the American College of Life Medicine, those groups are reactive. But uh, I've spoken in a lot of countries, different places. Uh, I, I just did one last week, uh, I don't know, it was kind of a surprise. Uh, these are paid customers listening to the lecture. It was live. Uh, it was over 53,000 people from 20 some countries. You're kidding, you did this virtually? That's incredible. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, it was, it was, uh, I was a little surprised. And uh, so it, it, I, I tell the guests because what it tells me is, gosh, this idea is getting out there. You're just going to have to take care of yourself because we need you to live like at least another 50 years. The people are asking, do you ever get tired of the standing ovations? Uh, no, I, I, I am grateful for that kind of enthusiasm. Yeah. You, you'd like to talk to people who like to talk about what you agree with, right? Well, you know, our mutual friend, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, has always said, I assess a person's intelligence by how much he agrees with me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Alan's a, Alan's a good friend. I, I've known him for many, many years. Yeah. 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 Well, I want, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. And instead I'd rather have you come back when you're rested and not that you're not rested now, but uh, this has just been so much fun. And so it's a wonderful talking to you. Maybe you'll bring Karen on. Maybe Karen will cook something for us. Do you think she would come on? I, I've tried to, I've tried to talk her into that, but she doesn't seem to want to do it. Um, she doesn't quite want to get on the stage. So she takes, she's the one that actually has uh, been the one behind the family. We eat what she cooks. Wow. So it's been that way for some time. She, I bet she's a great cook. I'm, I'm sure. It, I'm she sure your family. Yeah, yeah she, my favorite part of the China study was when she was packing your shirts. And it's like, she only packed you three shirts, I think. <laughs> yeah, I remember that, yeah. That was great. Well, you are getting a virtual standing ovation from the over 600 at least people that are watching now. Thank you so much for your passion and for all you've done to, because no, none of us would be here really without you. So thank you, Dr. Colin Campbell. All right. Thank you. You're very, very, thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you guys so much for watching. Come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. when we'll be featuring Chef Eric Lachesser making Pad Thai. Take care, everyone.